And welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. I'm your host, Harry Simiu, as ever. North London is red, but we knew that anyway, didn't we? What a show we have lined up for you today. We'll be reflecting on that unbelievable North London derby which took place yesterday. And yes, we are releasing on a Monday this week. We couldn't contain our excitement. Joining me today is Mike Stavrou. He'll be co-hosting and he is in the building. So uh, a big welcome to Mike. We'll also be talking to Arsenal legend Nigel Winterburn and we'll be hearing from Mems or Mystic Mems as you may know him. Uh, He'll be providing us with his thoughts following on from the 4-2 victory yesterday. Uh, Great show lined up for you guys this week so stay tuned right until the very end. Of course this podcast is sponsored by Loser Paul. Right, so joining me in the flesh today is uh, my co-host Mike Stavrou. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, mate. Buzzing, are we? I'm buzzing to be here, and I'm surprised to see that Harry's house is not um, adorned with velvet on the walls and red, because I just <laughs> thought that's the kind of guy he'd be. But yeah, I'm happy to be here in the flesh. It's a good little setup you got here, Harry. You missed it. I was in my silk red dressing gown earlier on. <laughs> you got like a bit Hugh too late. <laughs> not Harry Simu. So, North London Derby win, absolutely buzzing. Mike, your overall thoughts um, on the performance, on the game as a whole? Oh, where to start? Um, first, I'll start by saying that. I don't think I've screamed that loud uh, when Torreira scored in a long, long time. Um, Best performance in a big game, I was saying, in the last decade, honestly. Especially the first 20 minutes. We absolutely blitzed them. We outspursed Spurs. So they're known for intensity. They're known for pressing teams. And we did it spectacularly. Just uh, I wanted to know the difference between you know how comfortable we are playing out from the back now as opposed to the first two games against Man City and Chelsea. Just the work that Emery's done is unreal. Um, first 20 minutes class, Spurs obviously came back into the game. We had a bit of a lapse, a bit of a silly five minutes. I think Leno should have saved that um, that strike from a uh, from that header. Sorry, from Eric Dyer, and I think that. Um, Rob Holding was rash. I don't think it was a penalty, but I think when you go down like that, you give the referee uh, a chance uh, to give it, and that's exactly what he did. And then second half, we were unreal. Um, I thought Lucas Torreira, man of the match for me, Harry, and just, yeah, I'm buzzing to get one back on Spurs. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know what? I c- With these derby games, of course, they're always full of emotion and, and you get really sort of invested in, in everything and you, you get angry and you get happy and you get sad all at the same time. For me, I thought we started the game brilliantly, as you've said. And I think the way that the game turned on its head, because it was once again the fucking Mike Dean show, to be honest. You know, he he couldn't wait to give that penalty for Son. He didn't even want to give our penalty. If you watch it back again, it was the lino that flagged it. He didn't want to know. Mike Dean did not want to know. And I think it's abysmal that the Premier League have appointed him to such a huge game, given that he's, you know, his, his record in the past. People will say he's a Spurs referee. In my opinion, I don't think that's the case. I don't think he's a Spurs referee. I just think he's really shit at his job, if I'm being honest. I, I think that's what it is. I think he's just crap. And it doesn't matter who he who he takes charge of. He's, he's going to make mistakes because nine times out of ten, he's guessing. He's guessing. Harry, no... I think we said this before. No English referees in the, in the Champions League. Sorry, not in the Champions League. At the World Cup, sorry. That just tells you the standard of English refereeing is not good enough. That is why after the shocker with the Charlie Austin incident and he made a big fuss about it. That is why VAR's coming in. And it's taken long enough. I mean, it's been in the Bundesliga for the past two seasons. Uh, they introduced it to La Liga this season. It's about time England caught up and said, you know what, these referees aren't good enough. They need some help. And Mark Dean is just one of those. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, there are a lot of people who have opposed VAR and they're saying, you know, it's going to be a hassle. It's going to be a headache. It's going to be 
is not going to work initially. But the thing is, you're going to go through an embedding period, aren't you? You're going to go through a transition where maybe it's not 100% uh, functioning to its, its maximum capabilities. I get that. But like Serie A have done, like La Liga have done, you need to put it in at some point because all you're doing is falling further behind the rest of the football world. Serie A are in their second season of having it now. And, and you know, it's very rare to come away talking about a Serie A game and, and how VAR ruined it. Yeah, as a fan, it is difficult, Harry, because have you been in a stadium where VAR has been in play? I've not, I've not, I've I have, I was at an FA Cup game and it is weird. Like You have this kind of delayed reaction to every goal because you're not sure whether to celebrate because it's going to be chalked off if it seems like it might be a little bit offside. You know, you have them contentious decisions. Um, so that is the one thing that I would say. But with the standard of refereeing, I think it's left us with no other option Games will be decided, leagues will be won and lost on bad decisions, and that can't happen. So I'm all for it. I think it will take some some time for referees to get used to it. I think they're going to have to go for a lot of training. The first like six months to a year might be really difficult, and they will get a lot of stuff wrong. It will take a lot of time, but eventually I think we'll be better off. Yeah, I agree. agree. Um, obviously, Spurs got themselves level um, after we initially opened the scoring from the penalty spot. Eric Dyer, what a twat, ran into the corner where I was sitting actually um, and there were a few bottles launched at him and, and I know they were only plastic bottles but still, yeah. um, but Licksteiner, what an absolute hero, I mean A grade shithousery there from Licksteiner, he went over to him. I've got, I've got a bit of a different opinion on this, alright, Dyer is a twat, right, but I'm all for players giving the fans a bit of stick and winding each other I love that I love the passion I love the desire and it, it took me back actually when uh do you remember when Spurs played Chelsea at Stamford Bridge and it was the game that ended their their slim title hopes in yep. the 2015-16 season when Spurs lost their heads um and I think who was it Moussa Dembele I gouged Diego Costa was out for eight games I love that that's, that's what I want to see back in football. That raw desire, that raw passion. I think we're missing it. And, you know, Dyer giving it a bit just made it even sweeter when we beat them. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, but I don't mind it when we're doing it. Yeah, I just don't like it when it's against it, yeah. us. For me, that was, you know, it, he came over, he wound up the crowd and, and it made it even sweeter when, when Lacazette's exactly. goal deflected off him, didn't it? Because... Let's face it, Eric Dyer is, is bollocks, isn't he? He's oh, crap. he's rubbish. He's yeah, shit. absolutely rubbish. Um, and, and Spurs, uh, you know, they, they've got a lot of players like that, in my opinion. A lot of bang average players. And, and if you get at them and you play in the right way, they can be exposed. You know, a lot of people would, were asking me before this game and, and a couple of times on Love Sport Radio when I've been on the last few days, you know, are you expecting Spurs to come there and win? How confident are you? Are you nervous? Well, the fact is, I'm not that nervous when they come to the Emirates, to be honest. Of course, there's that fear of losing. Nobody wants to lose to their biggest rivals. But at the end of the day, if you look at Spurs' record at the Emirates, I think you mentioned it earlier on, it's it's not good, is it? Is no. it th there's no sort of statistical argument for Spurs coming there and winning. So, no, I wasn't really nervous going into that. I'm always confident Arsenal can beat Spurs at home particularly. Yeah, I mean, I was a bit nervous for most of you, I have to say, just purely because they had a good two results uh, previously. They beat Inter Milan and they beat Chelsea. But we have to remember last year as well, when we beat them at home, our team was in a lot worse shape. We were coming into this, we won 18 game unbeaten run. And uh, last year, we beat them 2-0 and they'd just beaten Real Madrid. So, you know, it is difficult and... I was nervous because they had a good, put, put in a good performance, but it is Spurs at home, and you have to think that if we did turn up the way that we have uh, in some of our big games this season, especially against Liverpool, that we would beat them, and th that's what we did. The only thing was, could we sustain it? Um, I think the first 20 minutes was so good, Harry, that it kind of it kind of hurt us a little bit in the sense that we were knackered a bit after that, and we allowed them to come back into the game. See, I'm not sure that's, that that's entirely the case. I don't think it was so much that we were knackered. I think it was more the momentum swung because Tottenham had been essentially gifted a couple of goals, in my opinion. Yeah. And, you know, we can argue around the, the free kick that led to, um, to Dyer's goal. I personally didn't think it was a foul. Some people do think it was a foul, and that's fine. But Burn Leno's got to stop that at his near post, in oh. my opinion. You know, and, and I was really disappointed because... Burn Leno's been brilliant since he's come in the team and you don't really want to have a go at him. You you just don't want to, but you can't help it in that situation. You know, it, 
yes, it's taking a little flick and, and there's a few players running sort of across his eye line as the ball comes over. But you've got to do better there. You've what you don't want, Harry, is a keeper that leaves you in doubt. He's a great shot stopper. No one's debating that. He's very agile. He made a really good save from Harry Kane's free kick. Yep. The thing you don't want, especially as a defender, is that thing in the back of your mind that's saying maybe he's going to flap it. Yeah. Maybe he won't go for it. There was another free kick as well uh, that Ericsson swung in, which Harry Kane headed just wide, and Leno was nowhere near it. And it does worry me a bit, but hopefully, you know, this is something that he can develop in time. He's still quite young, um, and I hope that he can get better. But in his current form, you know, there's a mistake in him, and we saw that mistake where we got punished at Liverpool. Yeah, and it's going to be it's going to be difficult for him, and I hope that kind of check can. You know, almost to help him out. I know that it's his sort of competitor in a way because he wants to get in the team, but he does need that kind of coaching to try and get that RB system. Yeah, I mean, I don't really want to have a go at Burn Leno too much because I think overall he's been brilliant. Uh, it's just there have been a few moments, haven't there, where you know, so you sort of I'm in an R in it and questioning maybe, um, you know, whether he should have saved something or not. I certainly felt he should have saved that. So, um, a little bit disappointed, but like I said, not going to go overboard on it. Um, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, fantastic, wasn't he? Brilliant. Oh, unbelievable, that that strike. You know, I think Aubameyang is best when he acts purely on instinct. I think when he has too much time to think about things, that's when it sort of goes wrong. And that is an instinctive strike there. It's un- unbelievable the way that he just caressed the ball and Hugo Lloris had no time to react and when you see a keeper like that just completely unmoved, it's one of the best things in football because you know that he didn't even think quick enough. And that's the, that's the quickness of thought that Aubameyang has. And um, I think there is a slight difference between him and Lacazette in the sense that I think Lacazette's more a natural um, hold-up play. I think that he's slightly better on the ball. I still think there's no reason why we can't fit them into the same team. Change the, change the system a bit, like yesterday when we changed um, and brought Lacazette on. There's, that, that worked well, didn't it, with, with Ramsey it behind? It did, but it's all about impact, isn't it? I think having that um, the, the option to change things midway through a game, I think that can throw a point, p- opponents off. I think opponents will look at our formation, and if you've got Lacazette and Aubameyang in the team every week starting together up front, then I, I guess managers in preparation will find a way of, of stopping that, find a way of handling it best. I think one of the things we've got on our side at the moment is our ability to change games during the games or at half time like we did um, yesterday. You know, the fact that he can do that just throws people off completely. We can change formation uh, at the click of a button almost and it is fantastic to see. For me, Aubameyang's finished the second goal. What was so great about it was the fact he took it so early you know, and that's yeah. why Hugo Lloris was, yeah. was left rooted to the spot. I think when the ball sort of came to him from Aaron Ramsey and you saw sort of the defender up there with Aubameyang, I didn't think certainly that he was going to hit that first time. And the way he did just caught everybody in the stadium by surprise and most importantly, Hugo Lloris. Yeah, I mean, he's a top class striker. I mean, in his last season at, at Dortmund in the Bundesliga, he scored 31 goals. There's no doubt in his ability. The only thing was there is that his attitude was slightly off and he seems really happy. And he, the whole team seemed happy, Harry. And that tactical flexibility you were talking about, I mean, I noted down yesterday because I wanted to talk about it, the differences in formation. So we started in a 3-4-3 and then two subs at halftime, Ramsey and Lacazette coming on for a Wobie Mkhitaryan. That was sort of shifted to a 3-5-2 where Ramsey went in as a 10, Aubameyang slightly to the left, Lacazette slightly to the right. And then Mustafi came off and we went into a 4-4-2 diamond bringing Gwenduzi on. I mean, three formations in one game and to not lose that impetus and drive while being in a completely different system, that is just incredible. And I don't think many teams can do that. And that is what Unai Emery does. His players are comfortable in a lot of positions. And I think that's where a lot of games will be won and lost. Because, you know, our um, our first half form, I've, I've got a stat here, actually. If we... Um, if Premier League matches finished at half time this season Arsenal would be 19th in the table wow <laughs> yeah so that tactical flexibility is needed because we really are not a good first half team but if we can start like we did against Spurs yesterday it shows that we can do it I just think we need to get up for these games from the start every game not just for big games yeah no I totally agree and that's right it's the fluidity in the change isn't it that's, that's, that's the key thing there um, I want to talk a little bit about Granit Xhaka 
player I've defended to the hills all season. I couldn't get away with it. Could I come into your house? It would be a Xhaka show. No, all, all I wanted to say was I, I personally thought that Granny Xhaka was a little bit quiet yesterday by his normal standards in the sense that I didn't think he got on the ball as much as he normally does, particularly in the first half. I thought that that was mostly down to Spurs trying to do a job on him like they did to Jorginho the week before when they played Chelsea. I felt that they were constantly trying to cut off the channels from the back three to Xhaka to Torreira. And as a result, particularly in the first half, we kept getting ourselves in these situations where it was just the ball was just moving along the back three and back to the keeper and back again. And, you know, it was like they were waiting for a mistake to happen. Do you agree that Spurs identified Xhaka as as our our main outlet and and try look to shut that down. 100%. It was a direct game plan from Spurs. Uh didn't work out unfortunately uh, for them, <laughs> not for us. I think they yeah, you're completely right. So they had really packed midfield. It was they, they were playing like a, a diamond, weren't they? So they had they had Son in there just fine Kane, they had Ali, they had Ericsson, they had Sissoko who were all as soon as we got the ball by back three, they went to shut down Torreira and Xhaka to close them off. And what we did really well, we adapted to that. So we were passing between our centre-backs and then out wide. A lot of our creativity, weirdly enough, came through our, our wing-backs. And that's one of the players who's been so good this season, Hector Bellerin. He, he was getting slated last year, absolutely slated. And now he's like one of our most important players. And I think this wing-back system suits us so well because of Kolasinac and because I think Emery doesn't trust him in a four back. So he's thinking, you know, give him a bit less defensive responsibility. And um, just on, on Granit Xhaka, I'd like him to have a quiet game, to be honest with you, because when he <laughs> when he's not quiet, he's usually causing trouble. Um, I, I think it was fine. I think Torreira was class yesterday, though. I think he was the one that was offering most for the ball. He was getting on the ball most. And uh, his goal, I mean, I love that purely because he could have squared it to Lacazette but he's like no I want my first goal in the North London derby and he ripped off his shirt and for me like that was one of the best moments of the game because it was just like you know the game is won Torreira absolutely loves it and um, yeah pure passion wasn't it pure passion and I agree Torreira was absolutely fantastic yesterday and I think he set the tone um, in and amongst the team of, of the sort of intensity and the the passion that was needed yesterday I also think Unai Emery's passion is feeding into the crowd. It's feeding into the players on the sidelines. And it's fantastic to see. Really exciting time to be an Arsenal fan, isn't it? It is. And I don't want to bring the you know the tone down a bit, but we do really have to look Here at... Here we go. <laughs> no, no. We, I, I just think we do really have to focus on, on um, Emery compared to Wenger. Why in so many games, you know, big games, did we fall away? Did we, you know, look... He, how many times would he come out after the game and say we were jaded? What, what do you mean jaded? If you can't get yourself up for a big game like Man United, like Spurs, then what, like, what is the point? He would normally say something like, well, uh, we suffered physically in the second half and uh, mentally and physically. <laughs> That's a good impression. <laughs> Same thing over and over again, and you yeah. get sick of it. But look, 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 this is, I don't want to get into Arsene Wenger too much because despite sort of falling off the... the What's the word? Bandwagon. Falling off, yeah, falling off the top of where he was uh, later on in his Arsenal career. He, he was a great. Oh well, yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, I'm not in to have a go at Wenger. I just it's just so stark, Harry, the difference between you know Emery's Arsenal and Wenger's Arsenal because this is the same team. Yeah. Effectively, there's a few changes, but it's the same team. And I'm I'm just looking at it in more of a standpoint. It just shows you know that it it was in them. It's it's, yeah. it's not the it's not the team. It's um, it's their mentality, which is the number one thing. The mentality from minute one yesterday was class. At no point did the, those players go in fearful. Um, and I think actually this can bring me to another point. Mesut Ozil, uh, Gary Neville mentioned in commentary that if he was in this game, he wouldn't have been able to press as well as Mkhitaryan did or Ramsey did or Lacazette did. And I think we're in a bit of a predicament there because clearly for me, Emery doesn't fancy him. Um, otherwise he'd be playing and quite an interesting point is that um, did you notice recently when Mr. Ozil's agent say, come out saying that he wants to finish his career at Arsenal yeah right I think that's a bit of like a ploy that if Emery does come out you know and decide that he doesn't want Ozil it won't feed back into Ozil's fault it'll be the club's fault because it won't be he wants to go it'll be that we want to get rid of him yeah, I get what you're saying. And uh, me personally, I was disappointed when Mesut Ozil wasn't in the team sheet yesterday. I know we're looking at 
things in hindsight now and that's very different but at the time when the team came out I was disappointed that he wasn't in it because for me he's our biggest creative influence I thought at um at Bournemouth last week we lacked creativity I thought Mkhitaryan played pretty poorly to be honest he gives you hard work he does but he doesn't have that killer pass that that final bit of quality that the Mesut Ozil does and so yeah I was disappointed but you know, like you said, will the team would the team have pressed the way they did? Would the team have battled the way they did with with Mesut Ozil in there instead of Henrik Mkhitaryan? Probably not. Um, but you know, it, it's a good problem to have, isn't it? Like if you can get results like that with supposedly your your most talented footballer completely missing from the equation, whatever the reason, whether it is a back spasm, whether he's not well, whether he's had a falling out with the boss, I, I don't know. Um, I don't think any of us really know. But it's encouraging that we still got the result, and I think that's what matters at the end of the day. Yeah, I think so. I think Arsenal fans do get a bit over the top. I mean, I even saw someone saying, "Oh, let's just let's keep Ramsey now and get rid of Ozil." Well, no. Like if you've been watching Arsenal for any length of time, you'll know that this is something that Aaron Ramsey does. Yeah. He'll <laughs> and to be fair, he didn't even start the game, so he had a good forty-five minutes. But he will have a good game, and then he'll go on a, a, t- a terrible run. And I think we have to take it into context. You know, Ramsey was good as, as an impact. I think he was good in that free role because he didn't have the defensive responsibility that he clearly doesn't respond to. Um, but I think that is a situation we need to sort out. I don't think it's a bad thing keeping him. Yep. Um, but obviously the deal needs to get sorted out. He's not going to get that massive paycheck that he wants. Yeah, And absolutely. we need to decide whether it's worth reinvesting that money elsewhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, we're going to take a short break. And when we return, we'll be talking to Arsenal legend Nigel Winterburn. So stay tuned. Nigel, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna, mate. How are you doing? It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Well, I'm very happy this morning. And I'm feeling uh, feeling really good, although uh, a little bit hoarse. Yeah, me too. Me too. Don't worry. Well, Nigel, uh, good to have a legend with us on the team. Yeah, thank you very much for the invite. <laughs> You're more than welcome anytime, Nigel. The pleasure is ours. Um, starting off with the overall performance, you know, it was a scintillating derby win. It's what dreams are made of isn't it as an Arsenal fan uh, coming from behind as well the way we did uh, what did you make of the overall performance Nigel? Well, I thought it was outstanding really apart from maybe a 10 minute period in the first half and maybe a 5 or 6 minute period at the start of the second half I really thought Arsenal bossed the game very interesting to listen to uh, Pochettino's thoughts after the game obviously he's protecting his team but I really did think that um, Arsenal performed to such a high level for 90 minutes. Uh, and it surprised me because I thought Tottenham were, were well off the pace for, for large periods of that game. And that has to be, uh, you know, I have to give great credit to Unai Emery and uh, the Arsenal players for that because um, it, you know, it was a very, very strong performance. What did you think when you initially saw the starting lineups? Because I don't know about yourself, I was a little bit concerned. I wasn't totally convinced with the performance at Bournemouth overall. Um, so I was a little bit sort of wary. But then obviously, I guess looking at the options, maybe Unai was a little bit limited in, in what he could go with. What are your feelings on this this back three stroke, back five thing? Do you prefer it to a flat back four? Well, I, I think you've already seen this season that uh, Unai Emery is going to change. Um, he's played largely with a back four. He switched to a back five. Even yesterday, we started back five. We finished with a back four. Um, so it, it doesn't surprise me. And I've said what I like about Unai Emery is that, um, you know, I'm going to a lot of the games now, particularly well, I'm doing all the home games and I'm watching around half the away games uh, live is that I go to the, the stadium, particularly the home games. I'm not sure of 1 to 11. I think I can pick 9 of the starting team, but I certainly can't pick 11. And I also don't know the formation he's going to play. Uh, and I certainly don't know the substitutions he's going to make and, and when he's going to make them in the game. So for me, that's exciting because it sort of says to the players, you know, you're not, you're not guaranteed to be a regular in this team. You've got to be playing to a very, very high level. And if you are, you're likely to stay in. And if you're not, then um, then I'm going to I'm going to switch it around and I'll, I'll try something different. And uh, I really like that with the with the new manager. Yeah, Nigel, just picking up on that point. Uh, obviously, we've seen the treatment of uh, of Mesut Ozil, who was dropped for Bournemouth, and after the game, uh, Unai Emery said that 
it was because he felt he wasn't physical enough. I just wanted to ask you, what do you make of his treatment of Ozil? Do you think that he needs to try and get him back into the side? Or do you think he really needs to focus on picking the team game by game, who he feels will be better personnel? Because if, if you're looking at it, I know that he did come out and say he had a back spasm. But to, to be honest with you, Nigel, I, I don't really believe it. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Well, um, I'll, I'll let you decide what you think about the back spasm or not, because obviously you know that I work for the club as, as well. So um, the, 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 I think there's a, uh, if I'm honest, there's a big divide with Ozil. Listen, I love watching Mesel Ozil play. He's such a talented footballer. But then you have to put the, the as I have just done, put the, the butt in there. Does he deliver enough of the quality for the 90 minutes I don't think he's that type of player I think he's a player that is going to produce some brilliance but then he's going to drift in and out of the uh, of the games and what the manager then has to judge is is that period where does the brilliance justify him being in the game or is it the period he's not out of the game going to make the team suffer too much and you cannot treat any player differently because once you start to, to treat one player differently as a manager, the other players pick up on that very, very quickly, and then you don't get a harmonious dressing room. You get it to be a bit fractious. Uh, and I think with a new manager at this moment in time, as, as I've just said to you, the way I'm looking at it from the outside, because I'm not around the training sessions, I'm not around anything else involved with the, with the team, but looking in from the outside, that says to me, we've got a strong manager on board, and it doesn't matter who you are, if you don't fit into my system as good as you are, then you'll be out of the team. Uh, and eventually, I suppose it will come to uh, head-to-head is, you fit to the way I want, and if, if you don't, then you'll probably be out of the club eventually. Um, but, you know, I, I'm liking what I'm seeing with this, with this, uh, with uh, Unai Emery, uh, and I would, I would stand behind it. I suppose at times, if you're a player, you put it back the other way. You know, that may be difficult for some players to, to get on board with, but I've been around many a manager, uh, and Let's, let's be fair when you're talking about it. Every player doesn't get on with the manager all the time. You, you've always got those little bits, but it's how the manager deals with that, really. Yeah, Nigel, I mean, I, I actually disagree with Mike on the Ozil thing because, you know, that we've heard about the back troubles for quite a while. This is not something that's just come out of the blue. So what I don't get is why so many supporters are sort of on his back and saying oh this can't be the case well you know we know he's had an issue with this in the past it's not something that's just happened this weekend is it we how many times have we heard that Ozil's got back issues so I, I personally don't understand the sort of witch hunt on Mesut Ozil I think he's a great player I think we're a better team with him in it than we are without him um, and for me he's probably our most talented individual so uh, I think we need to cut him some slack uh, Mike yeah, I mean, uh, funny, get on his back. I think he's got enough back troubles as it is, to be honest with you. Um, just just moving on, Nigel, I did want to pick your brain about something. You know, these players have been criticised as being weak, um, especially under, under Arsene Wenger in the past. In these kind of big games, they will kind of fall away. Um, you know, sometimes their heads will drop. To see the performance yesterday and see how strong they were mentally, going 2-1 behind in a North London derby, to then blitz Spurs and come back. Um, what do you think is the main reason that Emery is getting so much more out of these players, um, maybe, than Arsene Wenger would in these last few years at the club? Yeah, I think it's. I think that's a little bit unfair because um, you know we've. Uh, I think at times Arsene Wenger uh, against some of the big teams. You know, if you go to to, to the cup finals, is, has got his team to produce some some uh, you know strong performances. I think the problem is is when you're a manager that's been at a club for such a long time, you've got players that are not in good form or things are not going quite right. Is the manager will come out and talk to the players he will also talk to the press and you'll he- usually hear the same sort of lines week after week after week and I think at times that starts to well it does it starts to wear on the players and it starts to wear on the supporters that they say oh but we've heard this all before what are we, so what are we going to do about it so I think that was in the end maybe Arsene Wenger's uh, downfall is that I think he protected the players too much at, at times 
Um, and, you know, if they weren't performing to a high enough level, maybe sometimes he should have come out and criticised them a bit more. But I think with um, Unai Emery, he's, he's got that... He's got that togetherness um, with the team. And, and um, obviously from the outside, it's, it's difficult to know how he's done that. But maybe it is with, you know, what's, with what's going on in training. Although he seems a very hard manager, you know, in terms of, you know, it's, it looks as if it's my way or it, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's your out sort of thing. You'll, you'll be sitting on the bench. There's no other way. You know, you fit into my system. You've got to get on with it. Um, but then he seems to be able to pull that squad together. He makes see what's what's incredible to me is that he seems to be he seems to be tactically able to change things at half time. And for a player to be pulled off at half time is soul destroying. But then he's got those players backing when he uses them again, and I think that shows something about the manager that's 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 maybe been missing. Um, at Arsenal for 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 a little for a little while now, but so I think that's his that's his real strength and his tactical ability to to change things. Even when you looked at yesterday in the first half, we thought, well, it actually was a pretty good performance in the first half, apart from you know that those mad sort of five minutes. Um, but he saw something at half time he wasn't happy with, and then he makes the changes. And as I said to you, I, I really like that about the manager, but it does show that he's got a good togetherness within the team because the players coming off, I can tell you, particularly in the North London derby at half time, is soul destroying. Yeah, absolutely, Nigel. And I think for me, um, you know, like you said, hooking players off, it can destroy them. But for me, I think the fact that he's picking up results has, has helped the players to understand what it is he's trying to do. And they're buying into his way. And, um, you know, had we started the season poorly, uh, maybe he wouldn't have got such buy-in from the beginning. So it's great that results have gone our way so far and, and people are starting to understand and buy into the Unai Emery way. And, you know, at the moment, is it 18 games, 19 games unbeaten? Who who can question him? That's the, uh, that's the point, I think, here. I think he's really made an immediate impact. Now, Nigel, there was a couple of dodgy refereeing decisions in the game yesterday um I certainly thought so anyway I didn't think it was a foul on um Son which led to the free kick that led to Spurs' equaliser and then I didn't even think it was a penalty if I'm honest I sit right behind that goal uh in that corner and I thought there was nothing at all in that um and Son just took a tumble what what was your view on on the two main well, decisions? I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with you on the first one because I think I think it, for me it was a it was a clear foul although you might say it was soft but I, th- I think it was a foul there's no need you got Son who's facing away from goals um I think it was Socrates wasn't it uh, that made the foul. I'm not sure who made the, the foul, um, but there was no need to make the challenge. You know, you just need to stand up there. I, I think it was a foul for for the free kick, <laughs> but uh, I was sitting right behind the uh, penalty high up, uh, and straight away we said, not sure there was any contact there. And when we watched the replay, the clearly isn't. Um, you know, it's holding slides in. There's no contact. Son does very well because he tries to check back. It's almost as if he gets the ball caught between his feet and then and then he goes over. Um, I haven't watched it again after the first rerun to see whether actually Sonny's asking for a penalty, but my initial thoughts was that he wasn't. I immediately, as soon as he, um, the holding went in, I looked straight then at uh, Mike Dean. And Mike Dean doesn't make the decision straight away. He hesitates, he waits, and he thinks about it. Uh, and then he gives the penalty, um, and I clearly think he got it wrong. <laughs> what more can I say? <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair enough, Nigel. I, I, there is no contact. There is no contact. Yeah. Um, and people, I've heard some people saying today, but there doesn't need to be contact. Well, I'm not so sure about that because we're hearing where. So you could roll reverse that, and I could say to you then, well, so does that mean that usually when a defender uh, makes a challenge inside the box on an attacker and there's uh, minimal contact, the attacker goes over, and usually the referee gives a penalty? Well, then you should say, well, personally, then maybe some of those shouldn't be given penalties. So it, to, to me, there was clearly no contact. I don't see how he. I don't see how he could give a. I yeah, don't see how he could give a penalty. It's a, it's a difficult one because obviously with um with holding sliding in, it makes it look a lot worse than it is. And Son's kind of, you know, simulated that contact to an extent. Uh, Nigel, I wanted to ask you again. Um, 
after we beat Spurs yesterday, uh, they haven't won at the Emirates since uh, 2010, their only victory there. Um, with Spurs going to close to winning the league on a few occasions, maybe that's a bit kind. And obviously when they move into a new stadium, it will be a bit bigger than the Emirates. Do you think there's been a shift in power? A lot of people have been talking about that. Is there a shift in power uh, in North London from uh, Arsenal? Well, if, if, if I'm completely honest with you, it depends. Would you define shift in power to me? Um, listen, uh, there's no there's no doubt that Arsenal from, let's say, 2000 to 2006 were so far ahead of Tottenham uh, in terms of uh, what they won and uh, their performances. Tottenham have come back the last couple of years Listen, I wouldn't hide away from the fact I think they've got a very, very good team. Um, but power shift, what is a power shift? Power shift to me becomes when you're not only finishing above your rivals year after year, but you're you're sticking something in the cabinet uh, to really rub it in the noses of, of your near neighbours. Um, and I think um, that hasn't happened. So in terms of Tottenham finishing ahead of Arsenal in the league, the, yes, there's been a, a power shift. Um, but it's only been for a couple of seasons and we're yet to see what will happen long term. Um, but the one the one bright thing for all as Arsenal supporters is that there's still nothing in that in that trophy cabinet and uh, you know, until that happens I, I really do believe that uh, you know, you can't really talk about a a power shift across the, the other side of, uh, of North London for me but then many people will say I'm biased and I probably am <laughs> <laughs> no I think we we maybe fall into that category a bit but to be honest Nigel I would yeah, define a power shift similar to you maybe compare, comparing Man United to Man City um, I'd say that's a bit of a power shift City obviously picking up a lot of titles a lot of success recently I just wanted to on that note talking about City how do you think Arsenal can kind of move forward with Unai Emery you know it's different Difficult. It's really difficult to compete with City with their financial power. Um, in what areas do you think we need to invest in the side, and do you think we can eventually, you know, in the next few seasons, go toe to toe with Man City? Well, I think it will. Obviously, we've now got uh, a manager that, and we talked about the supporters are, I think, buying into. They can see what he's trying to do. Uh, I've got to say, I think uh, for me, the Liverpool game and the Tottenham game was the best atmosphere I've seen inside uh, the Emirates for a long long time and that needs to continue now and then you the, you look at the manager and I'm, I'm really excited I'm not sure about January but I will be excited about the end of season uh, and seeing where Arsenal will re-strengthen um, I think people will have their own conclusions where where we we need to, to strengthen. Do you know? People always say uh, still at times defensively we look a little bit vulnerable. Although I think we have improved as the season's gone along. Do we need another wide player to fit into that front three? If we go with a front three, you know, and maybe in, in one of the wide left or wide wide right areas. So everybody will have their. Everybody will have their ideas and thoughts about where we need to continue to progress. But the most important thing is where the manager thinks that money will need to be spent. Uh, and more importantly, how much money do we have to spend? And that will be the crucial thing because as we, we now know that £50 million used to be a huge amount of money. Now it's, it's one player. Uh, and uh, you know that may not be even in a in a in a major position. I would call it. But when I talk about major position, you talk about centre half, centre midfield, uh, and really sort of uh, centre forward is your is your I always think is your key area. So um, it's it's going to be very very fascinating going through. I think January, but particularly the uh, into the for the start of next season. You're underselling yourself, Nigel. Left back is a really crucial position as well. <laughs> um, going in, talking about left back, Sed Kalasinac has obviously um, d- played the last few weeks, and and a lot of people have been getting on his back about his sort of defensive capabilities. I thought he was brilliant yesterday. Um, I thought he did really, really well, and I, I really enjoyed sort of late on in the game seeing him tell certain players not to come forward for corners. Um, and things like that so you could see how much it meant to him what have you made of, of his performances of late because I, I feel he's improving week to week yeah I think he, well I think they, look, all the players will uh, improve under Unai Emery now I think you know they're, they're, I think they're, it looks like they're working more to a structure within within the team 
I think if I'm blatantly honest, uh, I, I think that he's more suited at this moment in time to playing the wing-back role. He's so, so powerful. He's aggressive going forward. I think he's much better on the front foot, so pressing going forward. I think a lot of the questions are asked is when you, uh, and we've seen it a couple of times this season, when they you get a quick switch against him and it, it switches from the, the opposing team's left to the right and he's asked to do a one-on-one job and I think sometimes he he's a big guy, he finds it quite difficult to get his feet moving really quickly trying to hold up the player. So in real one-on-one situations, I think that uh, that's an area he would need to work in. But he's got a lot of other strengths as well, and uh, he's so powerful going forward. And, uh, you know, he can be aggressive also defensively if he's on the front foot pressing the player and driving them back as well. So um, I've always said, I th- uh, to me, I still think that Monreal is is the number one left-back, if, if you like, when he's fully fit. Um, but... As, as we just talked about, is if a player I like, if a player puts in strong performances and someone's out of the team injured, then you've got to feel that you are still going to be in that number one position. And uh, so uh, that's what I think all the you know all the all the players are striving for. And, and Klasiak will be no no different. He'll be he'll be looking to put in performances. I'm sure for when Monreal's fit to say, well, you're not taking my place back very very easily. Yeah, absolutely. Also, looking a little further forward on the pitch, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. Um, I mean, his goal record speaks for itself. I don't think there's any argument that he's not producing the goods for Arsenal. But there has been some talk around him being maybe less effective um, than Lacazette in that centre forward position, in the sense that he's on the periphery of games for for quite long periods of time. But yesterday, he stepped up to the mark, didn't he? He was fantastic. Yeah, he was. Uh, and I probably agree that when you watch him, um, whether he plays centre forward or whether he plays out on the left, and you'll go and you'll try and analyse what he does for 90 minutes, and you might go, well, I'm not sure how much he was involved today. Uh, but then you look down the goal scores and you see his name's on there very regular. So it, it, I, I, it's very difficult difficult because I think it depends on what you're looking for it's like well you give me a guy that's very rarely in a game um, and gives me 20 plus Premier League goals a season then I'm going to take it every every day of the week um, we always I think as professionals you should always be looking at your own performance and always wanting to be better because you can never be perfect you'll always get um, your supporters criticising you at times um, but uh, as long as the player is striving to improve uh, and I think with Aubameyang it's like to try and get a bit more involvement in the game throughout 90 minutes a little bit maybe like Ozil uh, but when he's delivering so many goals it's it's so so difficult to leave him out of the team Lacazette is a player that I really like I think he is a player that can hold the ball up and be more involved in the in the game Hasn't got that explosive pace as Aubameyang, but boy, his finishing is still is still pr- pretty good. Uh, and the one thing that you see is like he doesn't half strike the ball. He's, there's no real with Lacazette. There's no real death finishes, is there? It's all it's a lot of his finishes are power. So I think we've got a real good combination there that can can work well individually in the team if they're both not playing, but collectively as well, which is another strong point for for the team. Yeah, speaking about someone else, uh, the goals are flying in, uh, Nigel, for our young boy Reese Nelson, who's off in, in Germany in the Bundesliga of Hoffenheim, scored six goals in, in nine games over there, doing really well. Do you expect him to uh, to play a big part for us next season when we recall him? Uh, well, he, he burst onto the scene. Uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? With a uh, couple yeah. of uh, particularly pre-season. Uh, again, he's, uh, I mean, uh, he's a player that I would love to see how he's going to develop in, in what it's, particularly in the wide areas. I think he can play. He really can play anywhere along the front line, I, I would say, particularly in the wide areas. He could play 10. I'm not sure he could play the centre forward role, but um, I think he's been sent away for his development. And if his progress is the way that uh, we expect him to progress, then I'm sure that uh, he's he's going to have a big, big say in, in coming into the Arsenal squad. 
um, you know, in, in the next sort of season, season and a half, that's for sure. Um, he, he needs to do that. I think when you come with a, come in with a big reputation, you, you produce some strong performances, there's a huge expectation. But sometimes it's not about your quality, it's about your 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 physical uh, presence. It's about how you mentally deal uh, with certain situations because, uh, as I say on many occasions, we all look good when we're playing well. But when we're not playing well, it's the ones that are strong mentally that come out of their poor run a lot quicker than, than other players. And I think the supporters see that as well. Yeah, and it's obviously we know how difficult it is in you know the top flight of English football, how difficult for young players to burst onto the scene and really make it. It's so good that Nelson's actually playing football out there and getting his chance. Do you think that's something that uh, young players should do more, go abroad uh, to different clubs and try and uh, learn their trade there? If, if uh, the club and the player feel that that's the right thing for them to do, uh, then yeah, I don't don't see it as being a a problem. I mean, years ago, I used to send them down into the lower leagues. Um, I used to say, "Well, we send them down to toughen them up." That'll that'll tell us we know even the same thing. We know technically they're good enough, but playing in the lower leagues, um, you know, you come up and get some real strong characters that'll really show whether they can come back and. Um, perform at the, at the highest level but I think what you're getting now is uh, teams are looking at the technical ability which is uh, a lot I think the team see it as a lot more important um, within the within the player so they can go off to like the Bundesliga which is technically very very good uh, and and the young players can uh, develop their education um, you know in in an atmosphere that's still very, very strong, but there's maybe not so much pressure on them uh, as as being back and playing playing in the Premier League. Nigel, just finally from me, um, looking ahead to Wednesday night, obviously we take on Manchester United at Old Trafford, a place that you've played at, um, and, and despite their sort of poorish form at the moment, it's never an easy place to go, is it? We'll have to be on top of our game to get anything from there, won't we? No, we'll need the level of performance we saw um, yesterday, for sure. Uh, and for me, this is a fantastic test for the team because we've even heard Unai Emery really talking about it yesterday. The result will mean nothing if we go and get beaten. It won't, you know. It'll just put the doubts back into um, all the uh, sort of pundits' minds, if you like, saying, oh, well, well that's typical Arsenal they win one big game and then a few days later they go and lose a game so what, what's changed so I think it's really important that we pick up some, some points against uh, United um, I think it's you know this, this couple of little games when I said I thought you know obviously everyone when, once you're a player you go we want six points but I thought if we came out with four points then that would be a you know a, a strong performance over over the two games but now we've took three points I want six so I'm greedy but <laughs> you understand what I mean it's important not to be beaten away at Manchester United it's still a difficult place to go yeah. there's huge pressure on United at the moment and I feel if we could get the start that we had um, yesterday uh, and get into the lead in, at Old Trafford then that really will start to, to ask some questions of Manchester United definitely definitely and Nigel when I announced that you were coming on the show on, I think it was on Friday, we put it up on social media, the amount of messages I had asking me to, to, to get you to talk us through that goal at Stamford Bridge was unbelievable. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, for the benefit of our listeners, could you just talk us through that unbelievable goal at the bridge? Um, Which goal was that? Uh, the one from Long Range. No, no, I'm only joking. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say. I've got it on my phone. <laughs> I was thinking I didn't about? get many so I, could, I can't believe you didn't think I wouldn't remember I only got one a year <laughs> oh no so I mean I listen um, I was talking to a young boy yesterday um, you know, I think he was uh, he looked he was about 10 or 11 years old he was up in one of the executive areas and uh, obviously I was going around making sure everybody was if he was everybody was okay and he sort of looked at me and it was quite obvious he had no idea who I was uh, and his dad said to him oh this is Nigel Winterburn and he said oh where did you play as left back and he said oh so you didn't score very very often and I said no I didn't to be fair usually won a season but if you want to have a look at some of the goals I scored I said have a look at Chelsea and maybe Wimbledon at home 
um, and that might tell you a little bit. And he put it on, and uh, I watched it with him. So uh, I've got a clear view of what happened now. I mean, literally, the ball sort of broke to me just inside of the Chelsea half. Initially, I just take it forward, and I'm looking to make the pass. Uh, and then Dennis Wise is coming across from central midfield. He slips over, um, and I take it forward and forward again. And then, what? I'm probably, what, 40, 45 yards from goal? No, about 25 yards from goal. <laughs> it gets longer every year. Uh, about 25 yards from goal, maybe 22 yards, something 22, 25 yards. Uh, and to be quite honest, I just decided, well, just take the chance. Um, and it just, I just hit it sweet, if I'm honest. And once I hit it and I was in the, got the sort of direction of it, I saw where the, the, the goalie was. No, I was ready to celebrate because I knew I, I was pretty confident at that stage it was it was going in. But you've always got that little bit of doubt until it until it hits that back stanchion. Uh, but luckily enough for me, it just it just flew in. Uh, and I think the celebration will tell you that what it what it meant to me really because I wasn't actually clear at the time that it was quite quite near to the end of the game as well so uh yeah it was um, yeah it was it, it was pretty sweet but uh yeah i mean you can't forget it one a season's about all i got but it, it was uh yeah it was a lovely strike that's one a season's more than enough if they're of that quality and i guess you know you said that you're not sure exactly about the distance i guess in them days there wasn't widescreen tv so it probably looks a bit further now uh, well yeah and, and, <laughs> and also every year that uh, i get older and people ask me about it, it it drops back sort of two or three yards at least a season <laughs> so i think it started at 22 yards and when people ask me now it, it's, it's at 35 to 40 so <laughs> uh, but uh, the problem is is someone asked me to reenact that goal about two years ago for a tv clip and to be quite honest with you i couldn't even reach that far so <laughs> I don't know how to reenact it, that's for sure. Lovely. Nigel, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and I'm sure our listeners are going to love it, and, and we'd love to have you back on again sometime. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for inviting me on. Just give me a call when you want me to come on. It's not a problem. Thanks very much, Nigel. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks very much. Now, that was a proper Arsenal legend. What a man, what a player. My thanks to Nigel Winterburn for taking time out of his very busy schedule to join us. Now, we have got a competition running this week, actually. Um, I should have announced this a little bit earlier on in the show, but truth is I forgot. Too excited from yesterday. Uh, my brain's still a mess. Um, so I'm going to announce that and what you have to do to enter before the end of the show. But before we get to that point, uh, another friend of the show, the brilliant Mems or Mystic Mems, as he's known on Twitter, um, he, he sent in his thoughts to the Chronicles of Aguna following on from the North London derby so let's take a listen to what Mems thought and how he's feeling after that momentous victory oh full time over at the Emirates I am absolutely buzzing oh what a game ah oh, unbelievable I mean we got off to a, a fantastic start um, we, we dominated for the first 20 minutes or so it seemed Emery got the tactics right uh, we got the penalty uh, we got the goal and then for a, it was like a crazy 10, 15 minutes where Tottenham were, were back on top, uh, and and they 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 got a you know a, a lucky free kick I would say it was a bit of a stupid foul on the edge of the box by Socrates. Uh, the free kick was whipped in by De, uh, by Ericsson, and then uh, Eric Dyer got a little glancing header on it. It, it seemed like we weren't really organised at the free kick, and then almost a couple of minutes after that, it was panic mode to Arsenal, and um, they got the second goal. Uh, the penalty, which is quite dubious, I've watched it a number of times on, on replay. Uh, it looks like Song was very easy to go down. There was minimal contact from Rob Holding, but Song he, he played it well, and uh, you know he, he was looking for that. Um, and then it was panic modes over at Arsenal. You can see it, Unai Emery on on a touchline, calming things down. Um, it was half time, two one to Spurs. And then, and then an inspired double substitution from Unai Emery. And that took balls to do. I can't remember the last time any, any manager has made a double tactical substitution at halftime. And it worked. He, he showed bravery. Uh, and 
it worked because the substitution, it, it turned the game in our favour. He brought on Aaron Ramsey, who had a, a, had a massive impact on the game, brought on Lacazette uh, at half-time. Uh, he brought off um, Iwobi and Mkhitaryan, uh, and, and that substitution won us the game. Let's make no doubts about that. It was it was a, it was a, a inspired substitution from Umay Emery, and... Um, Ramsey had an impact on on two of the goals. Lacazette scored a, scored a, a goal, and then Lucas Torreira, uh, the little dynamo in midfield, which we've been waiting for for ages. He, he got he popped in the box, and I I wasn't sure if he, he should have squat, squared it or had, had a go. He had a pop at goal, and and it went in. It was it was absolutely, and the Emirates was buzzing. The fans were together. Oh, it was beautiful, and um, <laughs> I've been giving uh, the Spurs fans on my uh, social media platforms all types of grief, as we should. Uh, let's enjoy this. I mean, we, we've, uh, I wouldn't say suffered over the years, but it, we've waited patiently for these days, and it was really nice to see the Emirates rocking and fans coming away happy. Gwen Doozy, there's a video of him get, driving away from the Emirates. I love that kid. I love the fact that, you know, he, he gets it. And it was really nice yesterday. And all the players played well. You know, Bellerin's best game that he's had for ages. Kalasinac played well. Mustafi played well. Socrates played well. Rob Holding was brilliant. Shaka, the captain, you know, he played well. You know, Lucas Torreira, brilliant. You know, Abamniam, what a goal he scored. The second goal, that, that, that unbelievable, guided into the corner past Lloris. Uh, Lacazette came on, Rob Holding, as I said. Um, you know, it, Ramsey when he came on. I mean, Aaron Ramsey, considering that he's going to be potentially leaving, you know, the, the professionalism, the attitude that he showed when he got on that pitch was brilliant. And, and I, I really hope that the Arsenal board look at this and they sit down with Aaron Ramsey and thought, you know what, let's try and work this out. Um, but that's that's another story. I'm just so happy that we've beaten the Spurs. We beat the old en- enemy. Uh, and I've got, I've got a big cheesy smile on my face now for a couple of weeks. So absolutely loving it. Come on, the Arsenal. Let's move on and continue this run. <laughs> that was the brilliant Mems. Always great to hear his views and thoughts and, and how he's feeling. Such a passionate supporter. Great stuff. And thank you very much for sending that in, Mems. Right, it is competition time. Now, in order to enter, all you have to do is subscribe to us on YouTube, The Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. And if you can, if you are an Apple user, please do subscribe to us on iTunes and leave us a review. Reviews are so important when trying to climb up the podcasting ladder, which we are desperately trying to do. Uh, So please do do that for us. The winner will be picked at random from those who have entered. And that winner will be receiving a piece of Arsenal memorabilia in the post. Now, once you've done that, if you could please head over to Twitter and tweet us at Chronicles underscore AFC, DM us to let us know that you have subscribed to us on those two platforms. The reason being, we don't always get a notification when someone subscribes. And as a result, uh, we won't necessarily know who has and who hasn't. So please do that. Please let us know that you've done that. And we'll be picking the winner at random uh, next week and sending out that piece of memorabilia to you. Thanks very much to my guests today, Mike Stavrou, Nigel Winterburn, and of course, Mems. Uh, We'll be back on Thursday morning looking back at the trip to Old Trafford which is just around the corner Uh, so non-stop program at the moment for the Gunners thank you again for your support it is very very much appreciated and we love hearing from you guys until then ciao meet our hero He's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people. Our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at Loserpool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. 
Razor Pool is similar to Loser Pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated, <laughs> and so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing, or to add a little drama, to a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun, and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account. Show your sports genius. Be the hero.